In the first installment of this series, I talked about subsidiarity and made the point that who decides is more important than what is decided. But there's another important dimension to the governance question. For you to decide, you need options. And to get options, you need competition. I mean, you know how this works. Go into any supermarket and walk down the breakfast cereal aisle. There are dozens of choices and cereal companies compete like crazy to produce new products that delight you, the consumer. And if you don't like any of those options, you can always buy eggs or bagels or donuts or any number of alternative breakfast foods. All of this competition keeps cereal companies on their toes and constantly striving to improve their product offerings. And it gives us the power to hold cereal companies accountable. Now, generally, competition flows naturally from consumers' desires to have options and producers' desires to satisfy consumers, in other words, to get their money. But there are some things called public goods for which the question is a bit more complicated. Now, most people think a public good is a good provided by the government, but that's really kind of a circular definition. In fact, public good has a very specific economic meaning. It is a good that is non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Now, that sounds kind of obscure, but so what does that really mean? Well, non-rivalrous means that you and I can both use the good without diminishing it for each other. Or stating it differently, if I'm using a good, you can use it for almost no additional cost. Non-excludable means that it's very hard to keep people from using it. For instance, if I could protect my house from a nuclear bomb, it would be very hard for me to not protect my next-door neighbor as well. That's what I mean by non-excludable. And if I'm protected, protecting my neighbor doesn't cost a penny more. That's non-rivalrous. That's why things like national defense are public goods. They're non-rivalrous and non-excludable. But here's the problem. If we just left it up to individuals to provide public goods, we'd never get enough. Most people would free ride, enjoy the benefits without bearing any of the costs, kind of like my cheapskate neighbor benefiting from my personal nuclear shield. That's the main reason we create governments to provide goods that are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. In short, we need a public sector to provide public goods. But there are challenges. First, government is a natural monopoly. Having established one federal government, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to go create another one. But without competition, there are no options, making it difficult to hold the federal government accountable. Second, once a government is established, there is a temptation for it to provide more than just public goods, more than just non-rivalrous, non-excludable goods. And if government provides private goods, it drives out competition, which limits our options and decreases innovation. Now, the framers of the Constitution thought a lot about these problems and came up with a very elegant solution, the Compound Republic. Disperse authority, put in place checks and balances on power, limit the scope of government, and make governments compete, including politicians themselves through competitive elections. And this is a system that is also sometimes called competitive federalism. But governments and politicians don't like to compete any more than businesses do. I mean, it's hard, much harder than running a monopoly. So over time, competitive federalism has eroded and been replaced with something more like cartel federalism. Instead of states and local governments competing with each other, they beg the federal government to intervene and establish a cartel to protect them from each other. Federal intervention makes states' jobs easier because it protects them from competition, although at the cost of giving their citizens fewer options, making it harder to hold the government accountable. Now, competitive federalism also relies upon the principle of subsidiarity and that the only way to create competition for government services is to push authority and responsibility closer to the people and force state and local governments to compete. So the more we centralize decision making, the fewer the options. The fewer the options, the less competition. The less competition, the harder it is to hold decision makers accountable. Unfortunately, these two key design principles of the U.S. Constitution, subsidiarity and competitive federalism, have been systematically replaced by centralization and cartel federalism over the past hundred years. The result is a system of governance that's not sustainable, dominated by special interests and unaccountable to the citizens. Restoring competitive governance, then, is key to getting our political system back on track. How we can do that will be discussed in future installments of this series.